Okay, cool. So today I wanted to talk about quantum computing and the potential impact on crypto. This is kind of a part two to the um, you know piece that we had last week where we were talking about the history of quantum computing um, and a little bit more about like how it might impact the market as a whole. But um, obviously we talked about how like cybersecurity and cryptography might get impacted. So that has some implications for crypto. And today um, we're going to dive a little bit more into it. Yeah, I'm ready. This is the Let's this is it. the this is the discussion I wanted to kind of understand the best. So this is, it's a really interesting topic, but what I'll tell you just, you know, as a heads up that I'm not really going to be talking about maybe many specific coins. I'm going to be using like Bitcoin and Ethereum as examples, but obviously like every, you know, coin has a different protocol. So I didn't want to talk about specific risks that might affect specific coins, but the two that I've just kind of heard the most press about are Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. So that's kind of what we wanted to focus on today. Um, but yeah, just as like broader risks to sort of pay attention to, um, yeah. but just to kind of introduce So last week, right? We talked about quantum computers and discussed the potential astronomical performance um, increases for certain types of problems. That being said, we are still very much in the infancy of this you know, area of technology, and we really don't understand their potential yet. But because quantum computers may have the ability to undermine, if not break, certain types of encryption, obviously that puts certain cryptocurrencies at risk potentially. And so today I wanted to talk a little bit more about where those primary risks lie and the potential impact on the crypto space. Yeah? Sure. Let's do it. Okay, let's go to the first slide. So a bit about Bitcoin. I'm ready. So, okay. So we've talked about Bitcoin. Actually, there was a very cool skinny on it, a two-part series um, a while back, if anybody wants to go check that out, that dives a little bit more into the cryptography of Bitcoin. But effectively, cryptocurrencies work um, without having the centralized authority to sort of ensure integrity and security by using cryptographic algorithms, basically by using math to ensure that transactions are valid and that people um, don't get their stuff stolen. Um, and a lot of this, like for Bitcoin, for example, is based on this concept of public and private keys, which I'm going to call secret keys because I didn't want to use something with a P as well. Um, but secret keys that are only known to the user and public keys um, that are mathematically derived from those secret <coughs> keys and may be visible to the rest of the network in certain circumstances. Does this is this bring back some memories of when we talked about this? Yes, I'm I'm very clear of this concept. Very nice. Okay, so we have secret keys and public keys and basically users in this network are assigned each of those. Let's go to the next slide. So when a user initiates a transaction, so for example, if Alice wants to send one Bitcoin to Bob, they're going to use their secret key and this sort of transaction message, this information about what transaction they want to execute, and they're going to use a function to generate the sort of digital signature, basically to sign off on it. And this is all happening again within like the Bitcoin um, blockchain, as we've sort of talked about. Make sense? Pretty yeah. easy so far? Yeah. Right. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So the signature actually has some pretty interesting mathematical properties. Um, so basically anyone in the network can take the signature, the transaction, and then the user's public key, and then use that to determine that the signature and the transaction message came from the person with that secret key without having to know the key itself. Remember that the secret key and the public key, those are mathematically linked, but we want to keep the secret key hidden from people on the network for security reasons. Um, but because of these interesting mathematical properties, users can verify this signature using public information, right, without having to know that secret information, again, because of that link between the secret key and the public key. And they'll know that conclu conclusively without having to know the secret key itself. Make sense? So far? Yeah. Yeah, it does, but yeah. now you're starting to get complicated, but yes. We're, this is hopefully the most complicated that it's going to get. All Good. we need to know is that, like, this is the basis for these math, like these mathematical relationships. Basically, form the basis for how we can execute transactions securely without needing a centralized authority to validate them. Right. We're using these principles of math and these mathematical relationships to basically validate that transactions are valid and that people's, like, you know, holdings are basically valid and secure. Make sense? Are you explaining proof of work? Um, that's a different thing, um, which I will get into that in a little bit. This is really just like, how do you sign off and authenticate transactions on a blockchain? So I will say that, like, again, I don't want to talk about like specific coins and protocols because every protocol is a little bit different, but most major currencies use this to some extent, even, you know, some proof of work, some proof of stake. Um, and it's worth digging into a little bit to know which ones, um, are, you know, potentially okay, I kind use of, this. I um, think, I think I get this. Yeah. yeah. This is 
Also used for a lot of like regular financial transactions is the secret key public key pairing. Um, and these sort of, again, mathematical relationships to ensure, ensure a certain de de degree, oh my goodness, of validity. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So these functions that are basically used for validating the signature or generating the signatures and then validate them, these are called elliptic curve digital signature algorithms. Um, and right there, so they're basically used to generate the secret key from the public key. They're used to generate the signatures. They're used to verify the signatures. Um, is this class of algorithms that are effectively used to make sure that there's mathematical integrity across this entire process? Okay. Yeah. Go to the next slide. So these are cryptographic algorithms that are designed to be one-way functions. Basically, these algorithms will always produce the same output for a given input. So when I put in the secret key, I'm always going to get the same public key, for example. But they're designed to be computationally infeasible to reverse engineer. If I have the public key, I shouldn't be able to computationally generate, for example, the secret key um, with you know, like a classical computer. That's where this is kind of going. Make sense? Yes. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So for example, right, basically breaking this type of encryption for, with a classical you know, computer would require brute force guessing. So on blockchain, this is like a 256-bit secret key. So that's two to the 256 guesses, which is a gigantic number in the worst case scenario. That's like the worst case loss number of guesses that you'd have to do on a classical computer. But but for a quantum computer, they can effectively, like, basically leverage elements of Shor's algorithm, which we talked about last week, to derive the private key from public information, which would effectively allow a user, you know, with a quantum computer, is efficiently powerful one to forge the digital signature and steal a user's Bitcoin, potentially, or forge transactions, right? So two to the 256 guesses, like, how long would that take on a computer? It's longer than the age of the universe. It's really, it's a really long time, right? So it's longer but than on the a age quantum of the universe. Computer, yeah, okay. It, on a classical computer, which is why, again, this forms the basis for a lot of different transaction protocols, not even just, you know, cryptocurrencies, but like some regular financial transaction protocols. Um, a lot of cybersecurity is sort of based on this idea that some algorithms would just take an infeasible amount of time for a classical computer to do, which is part of why, you know, these sort of like risks of a quantum attack as, you know, bearing in mind that quantum computers are still, you know, very much in their infancy, but, you know, pose potentially a long-term problem, again, depending on their actual capabilities that we'll realize with time. Make sense? Yeah, I mean, it does make sense. I just, it's hard for me to put like a lot of, I, like time, time, I don't really understand the timing of all this, but sure, I understand the, I understand the, I understand the principle, I understand the concept. For sure. We don't know the timing yet. I think it's something that I always want to make sure that that's clear. Like we, you know, this is, I would draw a lot of analogies actually to like machine learning, like machine learning, you know, 10 years ago had endless possibilities that we're realizing are actually not so endless now that we're actually implementing it. Um, quantum computing is kind of an analogous case to an extent. Like we know, you know, from theory what the, you know, some po possibilities are, some potentials are, but what we actually wind up building and the, you know, realized results from that might be different. Um, and either in either respect, I'll put some timeline estimates in here, you know, in a little bit, but we're most likely several decades away from like any of this being especially relevant is at least my own thoughts and what a lot of experts say as well. Make sense so far? Yeah. yeah, I'm good. Cool. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So public keys are exposed when Bitcoin is spent, which makes up about 4 million Bitcoin, um, which is about 25% that are potentially vulnerable, according to one study that came out of Deloitte, um, potentially vulnerable to a quantum attack. Um, they also claim that about 65% of Ethereum may be at risk, again, for a similar reason over this public key exposure is really where a lot of this primary risk sort of comes from. But that being said, um, be, because public keys are exposed in these two specific cases, again, it's worth looking into like specific protocols, learning more about that. But because they aren't exposed until they're spent, right? They're generally, um, what that kind of means is that you could just send your cryptocurrency to a new wallet that's never spent anything and isn't going to spend anything as a potentially a way to protect it. But obviously there's a lot of other implications and a lot of other complications that'll talk about in a second. 
Um, but this is something, again, it's a really interesting study by Deloitte, actually, if you want to go check it out. It was a really interesting read. Um, so, And there are other ways that um, blockchains, existing ones, legacy ones, can potentially sort of modernize to account for some of these cybersecurity risks. But some protocols are going to be a little bit di more difficult to adapt compared to others. Make sense? Yeah, sure. Cool. Let's go to the next slide. So this sort of public key exposure and this concern about being able to sort of reverse engineer pub, uh, private keys from public keys, that's really the main concern when it comes to sort of these, um, you know, these threats to cryptocurrencies. Because like I said, a lot of the protocols sort of use these uh, signature algorithms. Um, but proof of work protocols are also going to face most likely additional risks, again, knowing that there are a lot of unknowns. Um, proof of work protocols rely hev heavily on something called cryptographic hash functions, um, right? We talked about proof of work, basically, um, you know, we've talked about that in the past. Um, but these are also one way functions that are used in a lot of, you know, aspects of proof of work, such as validating blocks, securing the blockchain as a whole. And so while these are generally considered to be quantum resistant, like a quantum computer cannot break a hash function, I guess, um, they can potentially brute force solve them much faster using something called Grover's algorithm, which we also talked about last week. So what this kind of means and what this means in the specific risk case is that a sufficiently powerful quantum quantum computer might be able to have a like a major mining advantage in a proof of work network and potentially overwhelm that network to enable double spending which is a risk that's a little bit more specific to proof of work but obviously like most major protocols because of these digital signature algorithms need to be sort of updated in the quantum era. Um, but that's kind of um, that's kind of why like proof of stake networks are seen to be generally in a better position to adapt among other reasons. Make sense? It does. That's exactly what I thought. But proof of work would be Bitcoin and proof of stake would pretty much be everything else. Well, there's a bunch of other proof of work coins that are out there. And again, like that's why I didn't bring up specific coins, because, again, I didn't dive into all the cryptography of every cryptocurrency out there. Um, but like, for example, and, I'll, you know, this is also mentioned on the next slide, like Ethereum, you know, transferred or it, it sort of evolved from proof of work into proof of stake. And we saw that big transition happen. So these large scale upgrades of cryptocurrency networks are possible. We have a case point. We have a case in point of that. Um, but that being said, with Ethereum specifically, they have a more structured govern like more structured governance compared to other cryptocurrencies, which arguably helped in that transition. So that could potentially be a limiting factor for cryptocurrencies, other networks sort of evolving in the future. Got it. Okay. Cool. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So just to conclude, right on time almost. Uh, so quantum computers, it's always important to remember, a lot of people are talking about quantum. They're still very much in their infancy. And experts sort of estimate that the quantum era, like the era of quantum advantage might begin as soon as 2030 to 2040, but their capabilities are still largely unknown. And the quantum advantage era doesn't necessarily mean quantum dominance. So like we're still pretty far out is what most experts think about a lot of this becoming like very serious risk. Um, to some of our infrastructure. Um, so future cryptocurrencies could certainly built, be built off of post-quantum cryptography. There is a way to build cryptography, like cryptographic networks that are not subject to these risk factors. And legacy cryptocurrencies could, in theory, transition like transition to quantum-resistant protocols. So like I said, remember that you know in 22, um, Ethereum transitioned to proof of stake from proof of work. Um, which demonstrates that these upgrades are possible. But again, they had more structured governance compared to some other so some, compared to some other networks. Um, so that might be a factor to consider in terms of the long term. Um, also, in addition to that, because of, they have lower energy requirements and they use this val validator based security, um, proof of stake protocols are generally considered to be in a better position to adapt um, compared to proof of work. But there's still like way too many unknowns and still so much stuff can happen sort of in between now and when this might be more of a concern, if that makes sense. Sure. How can any of these quantum computing stocks even be relevant right now? Well, there are applications now. Like there are, you know, it, it's just maybe like a little bit more niche. Because um, remember, like quantum computers were originally kind of conceived to be able to run quantum simulations. And we have like computers that can sort of handle some of those calculations now um, with, you know, a smaller number of qubits. But like there are like cloud quantum computing services that are available now. But from what I understand, and I'm not like super plugged into the space, they're kind of more for research purposes um, as, as opposed to like more practical um, 
um industrial applications right now, but don't quote me on that.